He should be. I guess he'll just arrive at the. So you were gonna? Are you gonna say a couple of words, Ted? Or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would encourage you to, because <laughs> because you know John is going to do a whole, um, a uh, whole pipe, and then Jeff's teaching is like twenty plus minutes. So. Uh, so if you, anyway, take what time you need, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to encourage everybody to be succinct if they can. Much appreciated. Thank you. It's always one of these uh, dances of, of uh, allowing, sort of being hospitable to folks and, and uh, also imagining all the people out in the listening audience. Thank you. Nice to see you, Aaron. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for all you. Yeah, R and you. <laughs> yes. Well. Always up to some wizardry. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a very exciting I thing. I see my whole universe above the uh, Center. <laughs> well, well, it's good. I know. I've been thinking about you. You've been okay over the summer. And yeah. Yeah. Lots to catch up on, but lots yeah. of deep. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard journey that you're on, change of life and opening. Yeah, so. I, the good thing is Adrian and I are in great conversation and um, he's good. got lots of support in his career for his dad. So good. anyway, thank yeah. you for yeah. having yeah. Yes. Okay, Nellie, you can't eat anything. She's the... <laughs> During my all year, she, she's been part of my church services. And so now she has the role of welcoming everybody back. <laughs> Anybody have a walk? I guess. Is it time to begin? No? Your time is ahead? Is it? Okay. <clears throat> So we welcome everyone to this incredible occasion of gathering on this day. We light the candle of the four winds to take us into this ceremony. And before we begin our formal land acknowledgement, which is the way we begin these services, let me just offer a little uh, instruction or introduction to those folks who are joining us uh, via live stream uh, or listen to it over the internet. At St. Paul's, we have been on a journey of reconciliation for many years and the United Church for literally decades now. And we are blessed here at St. Paul's to uh, be the hosts to the Call 83 art uh, exhibits that many of the artists here have done in the first two rounds, and they are part of what we informally call our Reconciliation Gallery. So we are blessed to have uh, this art as part of our journey, as part of the education for the community. And this occasion is one to invite a new round of art that will continue to inform and inspire us uh, as we continue along this path. As part of this wonderful gathering of wise people and elders in the invitation to the artists, we also will have a sharing of bannock and cranberry juice as part of this celebration. 
In the Christian tradition, this is Worldwide Communion Sunday, a Sunday where people all around the world gather to share in the basic elements of food and drink from their culture and to eat and drink in the search for justice and peace and healing of the earth. So we will take the food and drink of this land and share that together as a whole community here. The elements will be distributed to you. So we invite you into this time of celebration, into this time of opening to spirit and what that means and inspires us with. I'd ask uh, Cynthia, who uh, brought uh, a new flag for us to uh, come to the table. So Cynthia, could you give an explanation to it? So good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. The flag is the result of the almost 2,000 unmarked graves that have been revealed over the last year. And the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has decided to put together a flag. Uh, just so you know, I'm the chair for Truth and Reconciliation at Lakehead and the chair for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation in Winnipeg, Manitoba at the University. And this flag was created because there was a flag lowering at the Peace Tower in Ottawa and there was a, a concern that, every, that the flag should stay down. But also there was a concern on the other side of the equation that if a dignitary dies, how do we keep the flags, you know, up, you can't put them up and put them down. And then the idea was brought by the survivors that perhaps there should be a flag that is specific to the children. So that flag is, is, was created to accommodate all of the children that every child matters. And that's why we brought it in. And I'm, I'm going to actually give it to the church because I think I can get another one. Somebody else. But <laughs> th you. that's what it was for. And it, it will be flown on the Peace Tower. It was revealed on, uh, on the 29th. Thank you for that gift. Mary, I'd invite our, the chair of our leadership team, Mary Phelps, to offer our land acknowledgement. Good morning, everyone. We acknowledge that we are privileged to be gathered together on your traditional lands, the lands of the Ashinivik of Rama First Nation. Councillor Ted Snake, Mayor Steve Clark, and former Chief Lonegu, and other elders present. We hope this sincere land acknowledgement emphasizes the respect we hold for this land and your people's enduring presence. We have much to learn from you. Miigwech. We're going to start today with a smudge. I always think of it as a ceremony honoring my ancestors as we uh, remove anything that may be attached to us that we don't want to carry. So when we smudge, and what I share with my students is that we wash our hands over the smoke of our uh, medicine to remove all of that and just to bring <coughs> mindfulness of anything that we touch is in a good way. 
and then we take that smoke up over our heads so that it clears our mind and that we have good thoughts. Then we take that smoke over our eyes so that we see good things and see the good in all. And so that we take it over our ears so that we hear good things and that it helps us to listen. Then over our mouth so that we say kind and caring words. And an elder from many years ago shared that to always think of our words as medicine. So when I share that with my students, I ask how do they feel when they hear kind, caring thoughts? And then always over our heart, so that our heart's in a good way and that we can move forward in a good way. There is no right or wrong way of smudging. It's about the intent of having our mind, body, and spirit coming together as one and that we can move forward in a very good way. So I'll light the smudge now. You'll love the smell. <laughs> I'd like to introduce to you uh, Ted Snake, counselor from Rama First Nation. Um, Ted? Wanin Boju, Ted Snake, Nishnakas, Ramadojba, Makwadoto. Miigwech, thank you for the invite for bringing greetings here to St. Paul's. On behalf of Chief and Council, we acknowledge efforts out of the 94 calls and the 46 articles of the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People, that St. Paul's is and has been nurturing care, growth, education, and development of call number 83 for arts and collaboration of projects. This is the start of the third phase and the theme is seeking new images in the future. I didn't know what to say here today. I didn't have no instructions, so I just came out with an open heart and I'd, I'd just like to share with you uh, 
last Thursday in our community at uh, First uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. Um, we had our 60 scoop group sitting up in the front two rows. And you know, with all their pride and everything that took place with them, uh, the hurt and everything else, um, they, they, they worked for the last year and a half on uh, interpretive trail project, which included the 60 scoop group, residential school and Indian day schools. So it's, it's, it's quite a uh, artistic reality uh, interpretive trail that I encourage uh, each and every one of you to come out to our community at the John Snake Memorial Powwow Grounds and um, visit. And they also did a, a film on, on the realities of what took place with them. So it was uh, quite moving, uh, touching. I know it, it gave them healing. Um, the truth will set you free. And um, it, it's, it's the transparency and the open, openness of what's starting to take place um, that are bringing things to light. So these type of projects that's taking place within St. Paul's here is, you know, it's relative. So I just, I just pray that the windows of heaven's open and they come into this place and work through the artists and, and whatever takes place that um, the education that is going to go on, that's going to be the way the theme is the education and getting to know one another. So it's just really important that the work that you're doing here and we acknowledge it at Rama and uh, and we used to come here several times, and Betty Naganosh, used to, one of our community members, was uh, was uh, here. So we just we just pray that blessings come upon this place, and uh, all the people that are in your congregation, and 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 that we move ahead with love and kindness. Jimmy Gwetch. Sorry for the. <laughs> the covering of Mayor Clark, would you like to offer a couple of words from the city of Aurelia? Thank you very much for the uh, for the opportunity, um, and I commend St. Paul's for this uh, this ceremony, this initiative. Uh, the previous art display that you, you started a few years ago and for this one. <clears throat> uh, because I believe, as, as Councillor Ted just said, education is key. And I've said this publicly before, when I became mayor in 2014 and started my relationship more in earnest with our, with our Indigenous friends from Rama, I became, uh, became illuminated to me that I was embarrassed by my lack of, of indigenous knowledge. And I'm fairly well formally educated, fairly well informally educated, and if I had that level of lack of education, then many, many others do. And I firmly believe that the way to truth and reconciliation, one of the main channels, is through education. So St. Paul's, thank you for doing this. I believe that art is a wonderful medium in which to tell stories such as these. Thank you. Chimigwetch. I'd invite, invite Aaron Dixon, representing the Truth and Reconciliation Roundtable in Aurelia, to offer greetings. You can take off your mask if you want. Yeah. I tansi anin bojo gija gate indigenakas, atopamiziwak meti kweendao, benesi okaninising donjaba. I am grateful to uh, share a few greetings on behalf of a collective, on behalf of the spirit of the movement that is moving us here. I introduced myself as a Métis person. I come from different waters and I find myself here today standing in my awareness and the responsibilities that I carry forward into the vision that's moving me. And when I, w I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of uh, Senator Gwen Boniface, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Lori, I look out, I see Lisa, I see Peter, I see Sharon, I see so many people, so many community leaders like Elder Jeff Maneg, Roseanne Irving who led us off, um, John Rice. I look out in all directions, including Elder Lorraine McRae who's not here, Ted Williams, and many of our youth 
that have gathered across the school to guide and continue to energize the spirit that's moving us. And we know that right here where we stand, we're actually standing in the land where our ancestors, the leaders of this place, are buried. We know that we stand with their spirit and have the power to move forward in a way that will gather all of us. And I wanted to thank you and thank all of the artists here. We know that the spirit of our vision cuts the wave of change, opens the spirit of our heart and who we are to carry us forward into that future that we vision for generations to come, into the people who we know we are as we're transforming through. So I wanted to thank all of the energy that Mary Lou, as a grandmother, as many people here have to energize that movement collectively. So many people across Turtle Island are standing, shining, and moving forward in our responsibilities. And I just wanted to thank the spirit of also the United Church. They were one of the first institutions to apologize when we think of Orange Shirt Day. When we think of the leaders that cut that wave of change, I wanted to honor the spirit of this church here as well for the work that they have done to gather what we know many are continuing to stand up and to honor that truth that will carry the spirit of who we are forward. So I wanted to thank everyone here for that gift of that artistry and that vision. It's definitely moved me every time that I've come here and uh, yeah, I look forward to what's to come. Jimmy Gwitch.
I invite Elder John Rice for the pipe ceremony. I'm per Scottish, and I believe that entitles me to a castle in Scotland. So, anyways, I want to welcome you this morning. I get no gum, 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 I get I get to go to my go, my shom sonic, knock my sonic, knee on a cake, a jam on a dough, a bob in a dough, the garment dough, meanwhile, give me a dough. Give me a aki que, give me a gesham in a dough, meanwhile, me bar geezes, meanwhile, geezes, you get me a get ten ish na back. Give no gum, knee win the considuk. Give quit my go, no gum, the quit the kit, got kinegago, gamizion. So I'm going to do this pipe for, for this morning and I want to say miigwech to all of you for being here. And the way that we give thanks for everything that gives us life, the four directions, east, south, west, and north. Our Mother Earth, whose lap we sit upon. The Creator, Kiche Manano, the great mystery who created and knows everything. We give that one time to think about that one at this time. Also our grandfather, the sun, our grandmother, the moon. And all those people who've left footsteps on this land before us, our ancestors, those ones who walked on this earth in, in whatever physical form they carried. But in this time, we give thanks to all of those things where the spirit exists, for those, those directions that, that I'm going to sing to a little bit later on. But at this time, I wanted to remind us uh, and then the Schnabek understanding of the human being that our gift is intelligence, and the Creator created us in a way that, that validates our intelligence that the Creator created us in four forms, the white form, the blue form, the yellow form, and the red form. He, she created us this way as, as a testament to our intelligence. And we know when we are in acceptance of each other for who we are the way the Creator created us, that's a demonstration that we walk with our intelligence in this place. So we think of that every once in a while. Just like at one time in our history, it was all the animals got together about us, human beings who weren't acting properly. They had a great council meeting about us. And they themselves asked the Creator not to wipe us off the face of the earth so we could continue to walk in this way in a good way. And in the way that they did that, we're still here because the Creator listened to their words. So as brothers, and the white brother, the blue brother, the yellow brother, and the red brother, we take some time to think collectively of who we are and everything the Creator gave us. We know the white brother, he was the first one lowered to the earth. His gift was movement. He came into this creation, the creator saw that that was his gift. He could move from here to there. And in the using of his gift, he created this great, what we see all around us. And then the next one that came was the blue brother, or the one nowadays they call black. He came and he walked in a way that he looked at everything. He took everything with his eyes. So the creator saw his intelligence. And we even know that this great civilization we, we know now began in the breadbasket in Africa, began with him and his intelligence. And also that one who walks with that yellow aura, eh? he was the next one. He walked in such deliberate fashion. He knew where his footsteps would be on this creation. So we knew by that way he walked that his gift was the understanding of time, that he could go. We even know that in his history, 3,000 years ago, he was at the pinnacle about to advance his civilization a step further, and he stepped back from that because he knew something would happen if he stepped through that doorway. So in his understanding of time, he made that measure, knowing that that would happen in a different time, maybe now. And the last one created, eh? I call us the spoiled child, <laughs> the baby, the red brother. When the Creator created us, we were afraid to come into this creation. We didn't want to come here because we saw something in our future. So when the Creator saw that, he understood our gift was intelligence. The gift of knowing something without knowing how we came to understand that is what he saw. But in order to encourage us to come into this place, he gave us instructions. He said, everything I've created, he said, my grandchildren, I want you to look after it all. So the red brother, we picked that up. We look after everything in creation. And this teaching I just shared is a testament to that. 
that we would do that, we would look after each other. So as brothers, we sit here in this time. Okay? We think about each other, the brotherhood of the human being. We acknowledge everything the Creator gave to us. In this holy place, this was a gift from the Creator. Okay? In the lodges we sit in, the wigwams, the hogans, any place we'd rather gather to connect with the Creator, whatever color we walk in, the Creator gave that to us and we acknowledge that. That's what we all were given. And in our intelligence, we accept that. We try not to change each other. We try to accept who we are and that brotherhood. So I'm going to send this song out for those ones who are thinking about this, moving forward with this artwork. The song says, where is the spirit? Where is the spirit? The spirit is in the east. The spirit is in the south. The spirit is in the west. The spirit is in the north. The spirit is all over the sky world. And then the spirit is right here, right here where we are, Oma King. So I know everybody's been here long enough in Canada to understand and be able to sing Ojibwe. <laughs> just, just teasing. You don't have to move. I'm going to move with the song. I'm going to face directions as I sing with my pipe. But the last one, I'm going to say Oma King. Oma King means right here. But Oma King is right here too. So in the last verse, when I sing O Ma King, if you want to hold your spear with your hand, if that's what you'd like to do, I invite you to do that, because that's where the spirit is. And as these ones move forward with their artwork, as they seek guidance from the spirit, the spirit is all around them, but the spirit is in here too. And as we move forward as people, we remember that where the spirit is, it's everywhere. And all the ways the Creator gave us ways of being, we accept that with each other. And we accept that's who we are. And it's a good thing that we can gather like this. So I'm going to send this song out for this part with the pipe. And normally we share the pipe, eh? But COVID has taught us to be careful. <laughs> so I'm going to be stingy today. I'm going to be the only one who smokes it, smokes it, okay? If you're okay with that, let me be stingy. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to do this song. Where is the spirit? The spirit is in the four directions. The spirit is all over the sky world, and the spirit is right here. I'm 
sneak to offer a blessing for the waters. Anin Bojo Kinawea, Gino and Uncle Quen Dishnakas, Bob Sheshi and Dorem, Minjikling Donchba. I'm going to face this way. And sit down young Bongi at the Nishna Bamwan. Major Mishnang Bemido. Miguach Nabe Kinagago in Nisha. Nisha Nineba Mazwa. Gabi Gay Mazwa. Raya Nukanamaz Gabi Gay Jawan Nabe. Nukanama Nanib Kinaba Majik. Raya Majik went in Benojin Yak. Babin Yak. Nin wak kwe wak gitchi chik nin wak. Shaganashi Majina. Today I wanted to offer thanks to this water. This water gives us life. The water is life. And it provides uh, our nourishment, our, our growth. And uh, it reminds us of all of those beautiful things in life and that, that we have that forever life as well. And I'm thinking about all of the people, not just the ones here, but also uh, um, those ones that we're connected to. Uh, and all, all, uh, all of those cycles of life, the babies and the youth, the adults and the elders, and um, I want to thank the water for everything that it does for us. And I know today we're, we're in COVID time, so normally we would offer this water to everybody. But today I'm going to ask this water to provide the nourishment that all of us need um, from it, its place over here. And I, I know that uh, I'm so thankful for the, the work that the water does for us and that uh, we also want to remind the water that we love it as well. Uh-huh. or um, announced. Um, there was a four-day sacred fire at Springwater Park to help the children cross over. And um, this is a gift of a song that came from that night. Um, it was a song that their spirits gave us. And the words are, Land where there's heart all over, miigwech. And o kanata, which is a Mohawk word that means, that was given to this area to be called Canada. 
Um, according to Peter Ochis, one of the, the old elders who's now an ancestor, Okanata means land where there is heart all over. And um, so it was pretty amazing that as they were transitioning, they gave this song to us. And I spoke to Lorraine McRae about offering it to the community, and she said, yes, this is a song that needs to be offered to everybody here to understand what is Kanata, and that it is land with heart all over, and we're from the land, therefore we are all people of heart all over on this great Turtle Island. So we're gonna do it in a, um, if you could sing, COVID would say no, but if you'd like to just stand up and bounce a little bit, you can wake up a little bit so that we can proceed. So we're just gonna do a, um, a presentation to the public for you to carry forth wherever you go to whomever you meet. You don't have to bounce quickly, it's good. We could go a little faster than that. Okay, ready? Land where there's heart all over. Land where there's heart all over. Miigwech. Now there's also gestures for those of you who can bounce well. And it goes like this. You can't sing, but you can move. Put your right, left hand out. You put your right, okay. So it's just a nice smooth land. And then grab two hands, make a little heart where there's heart all over. Land and catch up to your land where there's heart all over. And when you say miigwech, it is the land who gives enough. Now, if you've ever done baking, you know that you put your flour in the cup and then you level it off. That's it, enough. Not too much, not too little. Enough, okay? So, it's very simple. Here we go. Land where there's heart all over. Land where there's heart all over. <coughs> Miigwech, okay? You can do that at random while we sing it. So don't look at the guy next to you, you'll get confused, okay? Here we go, ready? Okay. Land where there's heart all over, land where there's heart all over, miigwech, miigwech. Oh, kanata, oh, kanata, oops. Okay, we're going to try that again. Okay, you get the main idea. Okay, here we go. We're going to go into rounds now. Just keep bouncing and moving. Okay? Land where there's heart all over. Land where there's heart all over. Me. Oh, Kanata. Okay, in the round now, okay? Land where there's heart all over, land where there's heart all over, me. Land where there's heart all over, me. Oh, Canada, oh, Canada. From the children on the night of the 215, a gift to the community. Sing it and move it. Chimi Gwetch. That was very challenging. 
<laughs> for an uncoordinated guy like myself to get all those things. We now have a teaching from former Chief Jeff Manig. Thank you, Jeff. Good way to start. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I need to know you. Gives it all them. My good men and awkward dish to cause. To me, go to keep them going on my own go. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, my name is Moingan Manakwe. That's my Nishnabe name, and my uh, Indian act name is Jeff Beneg. And I'm from the Bosley First Nation on Christian Island. And this morning, I'm going to talk a bit about um, our one of our wampums, our wampum belts. I'll not only talk about the belt, but I'll also talk about how it's made, how they were made, uh, what they uh, were used for, uh, what their purpose was, um, and I'll and I'll talk about two belts that, that are significant to the people here. Now, a lot of the belts that, that, I, that I can't talk about are the ones that were also special to us because we had shared this land that we live on with a number of nations, a number of uh, ind other indigenous nations um, throughout our history. And it, was, it was normal for us to, to move in and out of here and an ebb and flow. And each time we did that, we had agreements through wampums, through wampum belts that commemorated what that relationship was during that period. And those were treaties. Those were treaties between those nations. And today, uh, those, a lot of those treaties still stand. Uh, most of them are, are long and forgotten because many of our, our wampums ended up being taken away from us. Uh, when the larger society came in and started outlawing our culture. Uh, one of the things that they did was they took away a lot of our ceremonial items, including our wampum. So a lot of them ended up in, uh, in different places uh, throughout Europe, in museums, uh, even in people's homes, through the black market, and many of them may still be there. Uh, and a lot of our uh, other ceremonial items, like our, our pipes, were also taken. And I don't have a lot of time this morning, but I'm going to concentrate on, on, on just these. So what I'm going to talk about is our, our Miga Sapikan. Now we geo to win. The Wampum Belt. The Peace Treaty of 1710 between the Anishinaabek and the Onwe, Onwe. Um, represented by the Haudenosaunee. So these are our traditional names. These are, this, these are who we are. Uh, throughout history, all of our nations have received other different tags, but this is who we are. And we've had a peace treaty in this area since 1710, around 1710. Uh, and the Anishinaabek are us. Uh, we came to be called the Chippewa. We came to be called, um, throughout Ontario, we came to be called Mississauga. There were all these other different names, Sodawa, and then as you go west, you Salto, there's uh, Algonquins to the east, there's all these, but we're all, we're all part of the same group, we're the same people, and we are the Anishinaabek, and that's who we've always called ourselves. In the north, we'll say Anishinaabek, it'll be heavy K, and in this area, we're, we're sort of softening that, we say Anishinaabek, and that's just dialect difference, no big deal on that. We are the same people. And the Onyek uh, Onwe are the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, represented in this area at that time by the Odashone, which uh, got the tag as the Mohawk people. Uh, Iroquois is not their word, 
Mohawk is not their word. Those are all labels that were placed upon them. And, they, and, they, and, and I, saying that as part of reconciliation, we should be respecting that. As we've been saying for centuries now, who we are. And I'm saying as part of that reconciliation that that needs to happen now. That we need to be able to use those names and be able to say them. I speak English and, I, and I'm very proficient in that language and I think that that could be a give and take as well. Some people have said it's very hard to say those words. We learn them. That's how I came to be able to say uh, other things like Czechoslovakia <laughs> because I learned it. I, I took the time to, to know what that is. So I'll, I'll the next slide. Oh, sorry, I'm doing that. <clears throat> next slide, please, Jeff. There we go. So the, the, uh, the belt that I'm going to talk about is, is uh, this one here. And um, it is one that's significant to our area. And it's, it, this one is actually uh, a replica, and it sits uh, at the community of Ninjikening in Rama. So it's a replica because the original is no longer with us. But this is what, in the stories that we know, uh, this is what it looked like. So the stories, last time a story was told in any real significant way was in 1840 by uh, Yellowhead, who was um, one of the, uh, our Ogamawak, our spokespersons, came to be known as the chiefs. But again, that's not our word very different from our understanding of who we are, very different from our understanding and role in that community. The Ogamawa were the, were the spokespersons. They were not the be-all to end-all. They were not the, uh, the ones that told people to do things, and that's, that's what everybody did. They were part of a process. They were part of a, a democracy in every sense of the word. So before I go into that, I'm going to go back a little bit in history. So... Prior to all of that, this is the reason why all these things happened here at that time. Between 1649 and 1653, uh, there was the last end of the, the what, what was the uh, fur trade. And the fur trade took place throughout Canada and primarily in this area as well. And during that time, what was seen was a... Uh, for the first time ever, a great monopoly on a trade that never happened before. So when the French and the Wendat people, which are the Huron and now, that's what people call them, but it's wrong because it is a derogatory term. Again, they have asked that they be called Wendat. It is a derogatory term. And, and our research has helped us to understand that at that point in time, when Champlain first got here, at that point in time, in, in, uh, back in France, Huron was a derogatory term and used to describe derelicts or people who were on the fringe of society and, un and were not wanted. And that label stuck with them. And you got that label all over, all over the maps, all over the buildings. And I think we need to start, if we're going to do reconciliation, we start to take those things down and, and make reparation in that way. So the last of, of that happening was here between 1649 and 1653 when the, when the remnants of the Wendat people were being chased by the Iroquois Confederacy, the, or the Onehonwe. They were, they were being chased up into uh, our region here. And they moved on up into Christian Island. And between 16, 1649 and 1653, they were surrounded there on Christian Island. And many of them, there were 3,000 people went there, uh, about 300 Wendat people left. So thousands of people starved to death on that area because they were surrounded by the uh, Iroquois and the British forces. Be, they were being backed by them. And we, the Anishinaabeg, had moved out of that territory prior to it because we saw it as the first great imbalance, and that's what we actually talked about it as 
in our oral history as the great imbalance that took place in our area. And we watched it all happen. And when it was all done, after 1653, we began to move back into the area. And we moved the Haudenosaunee out, the Mohawk people back out of this region. We had a great war that took place over that time between 1653 and on through about 1710, when we had finally treated. Now war at that time between our nations wasn't conventional warfare of today. We didn't stand against each other day after day after day. Uh, these things were done in skirmishes for a whole number of years. And sometimes those skirmishes led to death. Sometimes they just led to things where we insulted the enemy for a little bit. <laughs> we, we would do things that we go into, we would sneak in there, each other's camps, we would do that and steal things from one another to make each other feel bad. And, and those things took place over time and we never did, like I said, we never did stand day after day after day. There was no war of attrition at that time. It didn't make sense to do that ever within our history because we didn't have a mass production of weapons for one thing behind us. So we had to get in, do our thing and move out. And that took place all the time over and over if we ever did skirmish. And it was a very big decision to get into that kind of thing uh, we don't actually have a, a word for war in our language. So it was a very big decision to be able to go against somebody to, uh, to take something from them. It wasn't just done in haste. So after that time, after everybody fleed to Christian Island, uh, th about 300 of the, the Wendat people left. Some of them went to Quebec. Some of them went down as far south as Oklahoma. And then some of them went west to uh, Detroit, Michigan area. Uh, they left things behind. So they left behind Fort St. Marie II on Christian Island. You can still go there. The remnants of it are still there. And the remnants of it are the same as they are at, at Midland when you go to Fort St. Marie of the Hurons. Which, uh, again, I, I don't like saying that. Um, but there was a fort there. And the fort is where the French lived and where, where they stayed in that fortified place. Outside of that was the Wendat community. And the Wendat did not live with the, with the French. And that was the same way in, in Midland as well. Our oral history tells us that. They didn't live together. Off of Christian Island was found uh, a cannon from that time. And that cannon ended up in the Canadian military, ended up in the Canadian forces. When I was in the uh, military, I was stationed in, uh, in large Germany. And one day I was uh, given the duty of, uh, of being a guard at the, at the uh, headquarters for the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. And I walked by this, this display case. I looked down and there's, there's the cannon from Christian Island. So I had to go all the way to Germany to, to look at it. But it, it, it stayed with the forces uh, for a number of years and now apparently it's been, it's been placed into uh, another museum in Ottawa. Uh, but the person who found it on Christian Island in uh, somewhere around uh, the 1950s um, sold it so to a buyer. Uh, the buyer had promised him a, 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 $200, which would have been a lot of money at that time. Apparently he received 50 of that $200. So I imagine his family's still waiting for the rest. So this area that we're talking about now, where we live in this region, uh, most of it came to be known as uh, Heronia. And that's where I talk about all that, with that words on the map everywhere. Uh, because it's important. It's the reason why is it's important to the European community uh, the descendants of uh, the settlers that were here uh, because it's where Christianity was born in the new world as they called it. And they, the first mass took place uh, just west of us in a little community called La Fontaine. And you can go there, you can see the big cross in the field uh, and that place is called Caragua. 
And you can go there and visit there. And it's commemoration of that. So that's, uh, that was the importance of all of that. So this uh, belt was the treaty, and this is the replica of it. This is from the stories that were told. That story was retold in, uh, in 1840 by uh, Yellowhead, Ogama Yellowhead. And wampum belts were made from, from these eses, these eses. These, it's what we call the little shells. And the little shells were fashioned into um, things like beads. And they were used, we, we made tools to be able to do that, to be able to, to um, make holes into all of these. Even to polish them down, we used these tools. Like, they were like fire bows. And it took a lot of work. It was very specialized trade. And there were people within our nations who did that specifically because it also created a lot of dust and people would get sick from that. And, and the word that we know is that um, we know through our oral history that there were many things beyond just the belts that were made from these. Uh, and this is the way they would have been done. They were polished down, holes put into them. Uh, we even made combs for people to put in their hair, very elaborate. And the beading looks something like this. We even made buttons for our, for our, uh, our clothing. We called them migas apik, apikan, migas apikan. And what that means is uh, it's the shell, the migas, and the, uh, the, the belt. The, we call them, in English, they came to be known as belts, wampum belts. The wampum is the word itself um, that's supposed to describe that thing totally. And apikon is, is, is what it is. So what it is, is, a, is actually, it's actually a strap, more than a belt. Uh, it, it, it is something like uh, what this guy is carrying, a moose head. And he's got a strap around his head. It's something like that. But it was worn across your body. And anybody who carried a wampum belt, they, they wore it across their body, sort of like a sash, and then there was a bag that they were, they were put in. So they carried more than one. It was an individual whose job that was, just like we had individuals who, who made them. There was individuals that carried them. And those had diplomatic immunity. They could go into any other nation if they were wearing their, um, their wampums, and they could not be touched, wouldn't be allowed. And that was the way it was all the way through our history. And so when, when it came to be that um, this belt came into our possession again, uh, when, when Yellowhead was the last person, one of the last people that we know to have carried it, um, it may not have been him to carry it before that. That person may have died because by this point we're starting to have a reduction in numbers to uh, disease. And then by 1840, when Yellowhead's talking about it, again, we have a greater reduction in numbers from disease. And our, our whole structure of governance, governance is changing because our clan system is, is being reduced as well. So a lot of the Gamawak, that would have been our, our seven traditional first clans would have changed because of just because of numbers changing. And so the people that began to sign those treaties didn't represent the, the seven original clans. So the clans that were still in operation at that time were the ones that were the spokespersons who were direct, they were designated to be that. So when this peace treaty took place, it was to end that, that 
battles, those battles that had taken since 17, taken place since 1753. And there's uh, Yellowhead right there. His, uh, his signature, he was actually Mskwoki. Mskwoki, as the English would have uh, said he was. But it's a mispronounced and misspelled. He was Mskwoki, which is, uh, translates as uh, the Red Earth. Uh, he took the name Yellowhead. We know that the Yellowhead name was taken at a certain point in history uh, because he was dealing with the, the British at that time and the person they were dealing with, they had great respect for. And he had yellow hair. So he said, when they started giving each other, or when the English started giving us English names and taking away our traditional names, um, he said, well, if you're going to call me anything, I'll be Yellowhead like that guy there. So that's how he took that name. But he's Muskoka. Muskoka, his hunting grounds became Muskoka, also known as cottage country. So the belt itself looks something like that, sorry. And it's uh, represented by these symbols here. And each of those symbols is uh, represented by a place. And there's a story behind this. So the story is that each of those places is where a council fire was lit in order for um, that peace to have taken place between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek within the region. So the first one, the first fire was lit at uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and that's represented there on your first notch. And that fire was to remain lit all the time. It was to remain lit throughout history, and we would go back and revisit it each time. Each of those councils would come back and revisit that. The second one takes us to Manitoulin Island. I'll go on the map there. Nedom Nis, Sault Ste. Marie, Bawating. Nedom Nis, Manitoulin Island is where the second fire took place. And it was represented here on this as the second notch but it was also represented on the ground by uh, a whitefish. And a whitefish was placed on, on, a, on a pole and uh, a replica of a whitefish was placed there it was to represent that they were a pure of heart, that all their words meant something, that, that all of their words were Dreboywin. They were gonna be truth. And that truth was gonna be carried on throughout history. And then the third one, was at Beausoleil Island, what is now Beausoleil Island, Bamadondguk, Bamadondguk. And uh, represented there on a pole was a beaver, a mick. And that beaver was to represent wisdom and the wisdom of everything that they had talked about. Everything that they talked about at those council fires was what their grandfathers and their fathers before them had wanted. And they were going to pass that down to their children. And that, that would be the way it was forever and ever. And that was not ever to be forgotten. And so for a long time, those things were there. They did have the representation of those there. They're no longer there because they had been uh, cut down or taken away a long time ago. Sorry. So then we, the next fire would have been the, here in Minjikening, over at the Narrows, at the fish fence. And over there was uh, even more significant because what they agreed to do, and that's represented there by the, by the shell in the middle, uh, was, was to put a, a, a plate there. And that bowl they were to eat from whenever they met over and over, they were to come back year after year and redesignate and recommemorate that relationship that they had. And the bowl would be left and, uh, and it would always be full of food. And off to the side, they would have the utensils and they would bring those out each time they met. Recommemorate their peace. Uh, uh, off to the side, there was a rock. And on that rock, there was a replica rep rep 
a representation of, uh, of a reindeer, a white reindeer. Now, so some historians, when they rewrote this thing, uh, they, they represented them as the deer tribe, but that wasn't who they were. Um, that was representative of that deer being pure uh, and, th and their words being pure as well. So they were to come there year after year and on that rock was the representation of what, it, what took place. Eventually, that rock was taken away. It was right at the Narrows. Eventually, it was taken away and we don't know what happened to it. We think, uh, we think it ended up in the black market somewhere. It may still be out there. We don't know. So a lot of these items do show up after a time. Oh, sorry, I'm going back to the next one again. So after that fire, then another fire was lit at um, Credit River. It's in the Magazi Bing. And at the Credit River, sorry, uh, what was represented there was an eagle was put on a pole, and that white eagle was there to oversee everything and to ensure that, that everything we talked about was always going to be guarded by the, by that. Our words were going to be guarded by the eagle and uh, those words would be taken because the eagle flew highest, the eagle would see the furthest and they would be taken to the creator. And again, we don't know whatever happened to any of that. But we do have a replica of the belt still and uh, that's the one that's significant for our area. So it talks about a piece. It is significant because this is the only treaty we've had with any other nation ever in our history that has never been violated or breached in any way. The only one. Every other treaty we've signed with every other nation, European nations, have been violated, breached, still walked over even today. So it is significant that, that we're able to show that this this agreement between two nations can actually stand and can actually be commemorated. For a time, we, we did commemorate that, and then when, uh, when our ways became outlawed, when it came to be a part of the Criminal Code of Canada that we couldn't practice any of our traditions, then those things were lost. Those things were set aside. And so what I'd like to see is, a, is that we begin to, to look back at those and, and to recommemorate that relationship at Minjikining with our Haudenosaunee brothers and sisters. And we should do that every year and have that bowl back in place again. I hope that we would do that in the future. It is important to, to commemorate that. Now, we go from that period in time, 1710, there is another belt that we talk about, and it's the one that commemorates the uh, uh, proclamation, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which drew an imaginary, an imaginary line along the Appalachian Mountains. Colonists were not allowed to settle west of that line. That's what they were talked about in that, and the, and the language within that was, was actually what they said was that uh, the Indians would remain unmolested forever and ever in that proclamation. They commemorated it with signatures, the seal of the British crown, uh, the, um, the dodems, the dodems of the clan symbols of the Ogamawak at that point in time. And this is what it looked like, 1764 on it. Um, or sorry, this is the wampum that, that commemorates that. This happened the year afterward, 1764. All these nations came to Niagara, and they recommemorated that 1763 Royal Proclamation, and everybody agreed that it was a good thing. This is the way it was going to be. 
Now, by the time um, Yellowhead is talking about these things at the council fire in 1840, things have changed. Because we've had the War of 1812, we've, had the, uh, we've even had the Cold Water Narrows Reservation happening and done with, really, by 1840, because everybody had been split up and moved. Uh, Rama got moved to where they are today. Uh, my people ended up on Bosale Island, and the others were sent down into the uh, southern part of Lake Simcoe and Georgina Island. They didn't want to go there. They wanted to be in their hunting territories, but that's where they got put. It wasn't a, it wasn't a voluntary move at all. So by the um, by time that he's talking about those things, at that point in time, this has all changed in a big, big way. There's my friend Alan who's holding these, this uh, belt. And that's what it looks like on the, from end to end. And you would have carried it over like a sash and into a bag on the side, anybody who carried them. And there were more belts throughout history, or a lot of belts all, all through the United States and then through into Canada. Um, and the, people tried to, um, tried to illustrate what they looked like. So there are some il illustrations of some of them, but that's all we have. So there it is. Our Amiga Sapican for this area. I, I just want to uh, mention that before I, before I go, I just want to mention that uh, I, I want to say thank you to uh, Reverend Ted for, for all of this and for the congregation for, for being so good as to, to uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming us here. I know things are different and I, don't know, I know people get uneasy when they see things that are different. I know even, even my own people get uneasy when we see things that are different but we have let our hearts go beyond that in the way that we, that we should have at the beginning. And, um, and, I, and I say that in being raised in the United Church and understanding my own tradition now and understanding everything in its place. Uh, my brother is a, uh, an ordained minister with the United Church and he has brought in smudging and the pipe and everything else into his, his space, that space there. And it's a very welcoming environment for everyone. So I commend you for, uh, for taking those steps and uh, you serve as a template for others to follow. I'll say miigwech to all of you. Thank you very much. Pigwich, Jeff, it is a path that we want to walk together into the future. So I'd invite Marilyn George to offer her song at this time. When we um, gathered to create the call to action 83 response, the question was, how do you say um, reconciliation in the Anishinaabeg language? And um, little did I know that there really is no word for it, but it's a whole sentence, and it's a very active language. The language has lots of verbs. And so after consulting four different language speakers, the consensus was, at that time, that the act of going forward together in a good way, in harmony, is reconciliation. So Marilyn, who is um, our singer, and she is an incredible song maker, she's made this her song of reconciliation for the world. Oh. 
Ani Bojo was an Ango Quaid in Indishna Kos. Gnabajin Donjaba Midlin and Da Ojibwe Nishnabe Kwe Makwanin Dodem. My name is Marilyn George and I'm from the Serpent River First Nation. I'm Ojibwe and I live in Midland. And um, this song is about moving forward and in our, well, moving forward together as we, uh, you know, uh, knowing that we, knowing what we learned in the last few months has been, um, you know, a sort of a blow to a lot of us. And uh, so we have to come together and um, get the word out there and share and talk about it because that's what we need to do. No. <laughs> Anyways, it's called Nigonin. Thank you very much. Um, miigwech, um, you hear that often. In English we say thank you, but I've been taught that miigwech in Anishinaabeg language means you have given enough. So it's like the three bears. This one's too hot, too cold, ah, just right. We're always striving for, ah, just enough. Too much and it's controlling, not enough and 
they could be starving. Just enough. So you have given just enough for our spirit. Mi guetch. Um, when the um, pandemic began, there were monies set aside for protective gear for First Nations. In 1918, the Spanish flu taught people a lesson, and it taught the Anishinaabe a lesson because it took one third of their population and language speakers, and they're in a mass grave. So when the pandemic hit, it was just after round one, and the people of this community said during round one, gee, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And so when the pandemic hit, we sent out a call. You ask, what can you do? The PPE was not being funded and delivered on time. Masks were absolutely vital. And so Ted put out the word. And honestly, it was a fire hose. I don't know who you are, but I know that you're great sewers because we could hear the hum of the machines and thousands and thousands of masks were made by the people who put their hands and mouths where their, their question was, what can we do? So Ted, Jeff would run, he'd come by regularly and pick up bags full of masks. Those masks have enabled Jeff to share that no one on Beausoleil First Nation this time around has died from COVID. You responded. Me, Gwetch. PPE was finally delivered, funding was opened up somewhat, but you filled the gap. You responded to the need. Thank you for responding to the call. This is our third round, and because when we were planning it, things were a little different in history, um, people were pretty ready to go ahead and become part of the process again. We're planning on doing four rounds, but so we're in the third. We've been doing this since 2015 when Justice Murray Sinclair was at Rama and opened up a big conference talking about what were the summary findings before they went to publish. So the act, call to action 83, is that the Canada Council for the Arts support artists coming together, both Anishinaabe and non-Anishinaabe, or indigenous, non-indigenous, to collaborate, to create works of art, to inspire all those who see them to acts of personal and public reconciliation. Artists are important. We get beyond the words. So because the third round came and then the 215 started unfolding and the truth started asserting itself, a lot of people were moved and disturbed and grieving. But this congregation came together and said, we know that this is a tough time. Would you please, please come together and do this? We need your help. We can't do this alone. And so this is the third round. And we're going to ask the artist to draw their lot, to see who goes in what order now. And so um, if I can, uh, I'll call off your names. And those of you who are here, we've had some cancellations due to children falling and children with colds and people having dental work. You know how life is, it just keeps moving on in spite of COVID. So Jenny Clark is not able to be here with us today. She's attending to her grandmother. Joanna McEwen, would you please stand up? Joanna McEwen is a settler. Jeanette Lucchese was unable to be with us today. Um, she's grieving the loss of her husband. Nancy King, are you here with us today? Whoops, she's not sneaking through the back door. Okay. Nancy King is everywhere. Nancy King is from Rama First Nation. Her um, English name is Nancy King, but she goes by Ladybird, Ogima Koibines, or Chief Ladybird. And her artwork is everywhere, from the Globe and Mail to all over Rama and murals to places under the highways in Toronto. Every time I turn around, she's got another group painting something incredible. 
John Ulrichs, would you please stand? John Ulrich, this is um, one of our settler artists. Peter Adams, are you here today? Did you make it? Peter Adams, lovely landscape artist, settler. Peter Adams, coincidentally, if you've looked at the artwork, Peter Adams has actually accidentally tapped into seven years ahead of time the psyche of what's going on. He predicted in his painting the 215 discoveries. And in round two, I hope that he's predicting the goodness that happens seven years later. Mercedes Sandys. Mercedes Sandy was unable to make it today. Her little boy fell, but she was unable to be with us the second round. She is now more than happy to come back a third round. Paul Whittem, he's been with us every round. He's a child of the 60s scoop. These are important times to him. They're hard times for him. Um, he, his um, niche name or his spirit name is Star Otter. Um, Xavier Fernandez, settler. He was the man who became the first and the last artist in our last two rounds. Can't wait to see what happens this time. We have a new um, settler artist, Ryan Osman, who comes from the island of Mauritius. And he is um, a settler to Canada and brings a very unique um, perspective. He's a photographer. And right now, he can't be with us because he's over in Matawa, then he's going to Kenora, then he's going to Newfoundland and Newfoundland because his job is to travel across Canada to help the water projects get developed. Marilyn George. Marilyn George, our drum woman, our singer, um, and her um, spirit name is Holy Star Woman. Christina Luck, Christina Luck just uh, moved to Ottawa, so we're going to send her to Gwen Boniface's office to help nip her at the heels to keep her aware of reconciliation artworks and to help guide them. Um, Guy Brandon Kopagog, did you make it today? Guy Brandon Kopagog did not make it today. He's a new um, Aboriginal from um, a new Indigenous artist from Beausoleil First Nation, I believe. There's Marianne. Marianne, where are you? Marianne, oh boy, Marianne's been an indispensable right-hand woman. She knows what it means to be able to help at the last minute in, in ceremony and or in launches. You watch Marianne. Hmm. Albert Snake. Albert Snake was going to be here, and Albert Snake is over in Christian Island today, that rascal. But he can't wait to see what order he'll be in. He, too, is from Rama. Tara Roy. Tara Roy, would you please stand? Where are you? Lady is keeping the elders up here um, ready with water. Tara is also from Beausoleil First Nation. Um, this is her first time in the call to action 83 as well. Then there's myself. I'm a wannabe artist, but I do my best. And we have a mystery artist um, that is yet to be determined. Wanda Maneg is a First Nation artist and she's from Beausoleil First Nation, and her um, name in Ojibwe is L Lady of the Warm South Wind. And I forgot to tell you that Tara Roy's beautiful name really means uh, uh, Gentle Breeze Woman. So we have Chief Ladybird, Star Otter, Holy Star Woman, Gentle Breeze Woman, Lady of the South Wind. I think we're in for a good sale. Mm-hmm. So, if I can have a John Ulrich, please. Is Lisa Legere here, please? Would you please come up here? I need your help. So we're going to draw lots to see who goes first, who goes second, who goes third. The first artist will be an, an, an indigenous artist. The second one will be a settler. The third one will be indigenous. The fourth one will be a settler. On and on and on until the very end. We have the dates of the trance. They have 14 days to produce their work. They have one day to transition it to the next artist. And um, so we're going to write their name down in the calendar. We've taken um, into account holidays and good stuff. So when um, Lisa writes their name down on the calendar, um, we're also going to then write it down on the next list and give the artists a copy of your date, okay? So Lisa, can you help us here? 
couple things. Um, Damon, where are you? Could you keep up with me? I need your assistance. Damon, would you stand here so that way I can be harder? So this is the non-Aboriginal artist. Those are the Aboriginal artists. You are the secretary and the writer downer. And I'll get you a pen. And Don and I are going to call names and call them off. For those who are watching um, live, um, you'll see what your order is. Now in this basket as well are a bunch of coins and plastic bags. These coins have been sent to us from the White Buffalo from Janesville, Wisconsin. Her first, the first White Buffalo was Miracle, the second one was Millennium, and the third one, which was a little male who was, died shortly thereafter, was Fulfillment. Whenever we do this project, we offer tobacco to the White Buffalo down there. And the last time I was there, she, uh, the owner of the property, gave us these Canadian coins because the Canadians were coming down and buying souvenirs, etc. <coughs> but the U.S. banks thought it was Monopoly money. So she sent it up and said, here, take these back to Canada where they belong. So each artist, when they draw their name, will also draw a coin, and that will be going with their work of art this time around. Okay? So, Damon, would you please, is the easiest call out? Okay, the date and the indigenous, okay? Sure. Real loud over here. Okay. October 18th is the start date for our first Indigenous artist. First Indigenous artist. Okay, Damon, you want to pull a name there? Okay. And John's going to read it. Real good. Everybody's hoping they're not first. Oh! I had to get mine too. Did you want to borrow mine? Just leave soft place where they won't get scratched. I know that trick. How are we going to move this off? Okay. Do you want to have all three sheets made? I'll just do it on the first sheet and rotate it. The winner is number 15, Albert Snatchet. Albert Snake. Snake. Albert Snake, you are going to launch this project. And Damon, um, would you please pick a coin for Albert Snake? We're going to give that to, what was Mr. Smith called? Did you read it? No. <laughs> Looking for Albert. Probably not, but I'll leave my thing. Okay, we're just going to hang on to this for Albert. Okay, that's Albert. Okay. And the first settler artist, please let it not be me, is going to be Jeanette Lucchese. Okay, so she's mm -hmm. number one. Okay. The third artist is, is uh, Mercedes Sandy. Oh, good. Mercedes Sandy. Mercedes, are you watching? Is this the fourth one? Yep. The and the second settler, or the fourth one, is Joanna McCune. Would you please choose your lucky coin from the white buffalo? There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the fifth artist. So this is the mystery artist. Okay, draw another one. one. Draw another one for now. Number 16, Tara Roy. Tara Roy, where are you? There you go, okay. Pick a coin. Tara Roy, your date is, what is it? January 3rd. January 3rd, after the New Year's. Mm hmm. Oh. <laughs> okay. 
And the next one is a settler, and this is going to be Xavier, you're not number one or number 18 this time. Xavier, you're next. You got January 18th to January 31st. And, oops, there you go. Would you please pick a coin? Okay, thank you. Okay. Number 19, Wanda Maneg. Wanda Maneg is a seventh artist. She'll be doing it from February 2nd to February 15th. Wanda, are you watching? I hope that you can smile with that dental problem there. Okay, uh, okay the next artist is Peter Adams. Peter. Peter will be doing his work in the new year, February 17th. There's a holiday in there, you've got kids, you've got time off, and your final date is March 6th. Please pick a coin. Thank you. Okay, next indigenous artist. Paul Whittem, number eight. Paul Whittem. Paul Whittem will be doing his work March 8th to March 31st. And the next artist is a settler artist, and her name is Jenny Clark. Jenny Clark will be doing her work April 1st to April 19th. from the basket, and you will be doing your work April 20th to May 3rd. Okay. Uh -huh. Looking forward to it. And the next settler is John Ulrich. John, <laughs> pick a coin. And he will be doing his work from May 5th to May 18th. We'll be doing his work May 24th to June 6th. And the next settler artist is moi, Mary Lou Myers. Boy, I'm glad it's in June. <laughs> I need a coin. Okay. Oh, number 11, Marilyn George. Marilyn. Would you like, Damon, would you like to go over and she can pick a coin? And our next settler artist is Ryan Osman. Ryan is from the island of Mauritius. And he's new and he's so excited and he's up in Mottawa right now watching us. Ryan, you'll be doing your work July 10th to July 23rd. So don't hook yourself up north anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's no more? Nope. Some more here. Okay. And the next artist is going to be the To Be Determined. Okay. It's the secret. Mm -hmm. Jeff hasn't got confirmation on it yet. Okay. And our last and final anchor person is Christina Luck. She's going to be doing her work, even though she's from Simcoe County and just moved. She'll be doing it probably right outside Gwen Boniface's door and where anybody else in Parliament she can find. And she will be doing it August 9th to the 22nd, just before we start reconciliation time again in September. We will um, unveil the project probably the same time next year as this launch. Um, and we will have a um, private unveiling the artists ahead of time so that they can process it, the results emotionally and as a group and read the story together. We'll then have an opening here um, in the community center 
and then it will go wherever the Creator asks it to go. So those of you who are um, artists in this process, if you would please just come forward for a minute. Um, there are the, port, the board members um, would like to um, say something for you. Um, Peter, can you come up please so we can give you your tobacco? Now, whereas the Europe, our European tradition, we sign a contract, First Nation tradition is we accept tobacco. So you can at the last minute chicken out if you like. This is always suspenseful. Um, after the board member um, reads what they're going to pledge to do, we will offer each one of you tobacco and everybody hold your breath and um, you can either accept it or not accept it and we're hoping that you will. Okay, Ted. So Mary and Harvey, could you come forward to offer the tobacco? And I would ask uh, all of us as the St. Paul's community to stand and uh, we'll make this pledge to the artists. So this is what we are pledging. We pledge our support to you as you seek images from the kind spirit that will lead us forward together in a good way, in harmony. We join you in asking that the images and stories touch the hearts and imaginations of all who experience them and inspire them to personal and public acts of reconciliation. Each time the bundle is passed, we as the center, as St. Paul's, will light the reconciliation candle, repeat the request to the kind spirit, and offer a minute of quiet, quiet reflection to support your process. A year from now, we will offer this center to privately, then publicly, reveal the stories and images. We will feast you and the works. Okay, it looks like everybody's accepting, nobody's declined. That's a breath of fresh air. You know, in the olden days, I was taught that when a village was suffering a situation where they couldn't solve the problem and their health and well-being was endangered, the elders agreed to send out everybody in the village out into the woods or into nature to sit for X number of days and on an, appropriate, on a, an appointed time, all of the village would come back then to the center around the fire and they would share what they saw, what they heard, and the images, and what it was that creation and the spirits gave them. The community would then take all of that information, and they would then make the decisions on how to go forward. That's what we're asking these artists to do on the behalf of every one of us. We're asking them to take that, go out and fast. Producing a work of art in 14 days is like producing an elephant in nine days. It's really an experience that's pressured. So we're asking them to suffer that creative process and to hold the spirit of this reconciliation project in, in quiet, in their heart, until the very end when it's revealed. So the community is asking you to do that for them. And then thank you very much for accepting that invitation. And it's a, an agreement now. It is cast in tobacco, okay? Now, 
Albert Snake is the first, so Albert will be the first to receive the medicine bundle when we get together on October 16th for a sweat lodge. So Albert will begin. All the artists um, may put something in the medicine bundle, but they may not take anything out. This has gone through all the artists' hands, through all the works of art, and this white feather is an eagle feather that was granted us from Springwater Park from the last eagle that resided there. It's our reconciliation feather that was gifted to us from the park people. So the first person to receive this will be Albert on that day. After 14 days, Albert will have one day to transition this bundle to the next artist and show them their, his artwork. That artist then will be inspired by that work, receive the feather in the bundle, and then give them back their artwork and do their 14 days of suffering and image seeking. No one will speak about anybody's work except the one that they pass on to the next person. At the end, each individual original work will be inspired by one person, but it will be one page in a story that the great spirit and the kind spirit has granted this community at this time in history with the teachings of our responsibilities and agreements of the wampum that Jeff Maneg shared with us. Every, year, every time we do a round, we get another teaching. You're part of this round, you get the teaching. So if you would please take the tobacco that you've received in your hand and hang on to that this year and think about those responsibilities and the stories and if you have questions, just call. Ted can forward you on to the right people to help you find the answers. Start thinking, read the calls to action. Read the story of the call to action. Think about your action. Thank you very much. Marilyn, are you going to drum us out? Oh, no. Ted, did you want to say something? We're going to have our feast now. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Wait, don't go away. It's feasting time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cynthia? Since this is, as I mentioned, it is Worldwide Communion Sunday in the Christian tradition, but we want to extend that tradition to all peoples of good heart and to share in this celebration of food and drink together. Food and drink that has been prepared on this land for many generations. And so we offer this feast and these words as celebration of coming together and to sharing in a feast of solidarity and liberation. So in the Christian tradition, this Sunday is called Worldwide Communion. It is a time of gathering of all peoples of goodwill to eat and drink together. We offer thanks for the gift of life and the life blessed by our interrelationship with all of creation. This is fundamental to all who live on this wondrous planetary home as it continues to evolve in beauty, mystery, and benevolence for all. We also share these gifts of life in recognition that they represent our human struggles to live in just and harmonious ways. This ritual of sharing food and drink binds us together in this liberative journey. In times gone by, the hill tribes people of Palestine were enslaved by the Egyptian empire. In seeking their liberation, they shared unleavened bread and wine common to them in a feast that they came to call Passover. They escaped to the desert as they sought to find their identity as a people. Also, this exodus marked a new beginning in seeking to understand Yahweh or Creator's purpose for them. Many centuries later, Jesus of Nazareth, a peasant from a small village near the Sea of Galilee, also carried a message of liberation from the authoritarian rule of the Roman Empire and to its client state authorities. As custom to his people, he shared the Passover feast with his friends, 
calling for an exodus from the colonial rule of his day and a return to the divine calling of compassion, love, and justice for all. The remembrance of sharing this feast in this way led to his cruel execution as a political subversive. In these times, we again drink together with the purpose of liberating ourselves from the injustices of these days and finding ways towards a renewed interrelationship with all, human and planetary. We seek a new common good. We share the gifts from this land, bannock and cranberry juice. As people have done here, even before the first Passover feast by the hill tribes enslaved in Egypt. So, may the eating of this bannock invite our understanding of what it truly means to reconcile with each other and our planetary home. A facing into the truth of harms done and its systematic reality through the whole of our society. We eat this to give us courage to do this work. So also may we take this cranberry juice in the spirit of renewal and hope, the dwelling in beauty, wonder, and responsibility. We are truly blessed in our gift of life. So may this drink invite us to celebrate this goodness and know the gift of love. So we will share our we have servers who can come forward and will help us. And so we will share in the distribution of the bannock and the cranberry juice so that all of us can partake together. So we'd ask you to uh, hold the bannock and to hold the juice and Cynthia and I will uh, initiate the eating and drinking together. Our servers could take the, the manic and the juice. Maybe you could distribute to those folks. have gluten-free uh, bread for those who would like it, and Christine will make that available to you.
So we share this bannock, we break bread together as an act of sharing and unity. So too do we drink together in solidarity, in the call for love and justice and peace in the world. Let us drink together. So we are truly blessed to have gathered here today to be in Creator's presence, in the spirit of goodness that holds each one of us and invites us to acts of reconciliation, to hearing the stories of who we have been, the harm we have caused, the opportunity to go forward seeking wholeness and health and healing on the journey towards a time of peace and caring and compassion for all. So thank you for being part of this time. Go now in peace and caring and love. Amen.